Hello. Special thanks to Ona Saber for sponsoring our 90,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. We're so close to giving away the lightsabers. Down below, down below. Our story begins two years after Lord Vader was defeated on Mustafar. His mere existence was bouncing between worlds doing the Emperor's bidding. He killed Jedi and did mundane tasks. Most of these tasks were just a means of punishment, but Vader hadn't yet seen it in that way. Vader, due to his suit, was suffering endlessly. He existed. When he was just not doing tasks, he was sitting in Bacta tanks, and aside from the Bacta that surrounded him, he existed in a perpetual state of self-loathing. All the countless hours he had to himself to think about what he had done. The irony being is that it could be very easily explained as him shifting blame. Some days he had dreams about returning to Obi-Wan and apologizing, wishing everything could be undone. Some days he wished he never joined Sidious in the first place. Other days he wished he was strong enough to kill Obi-Wan on Mustafar. He would still have Padme, and he could be Emperor of the Galaxy if he wanted, not that he wanted to begin with. But what sat in his heart of each and every single one of these thoughts was his feelings about his wife, Padme. She was all he wanted back. It didn't matter what he would sacrifice for her. All he knew is that he wanted her, yet there was no way to bring her back. Sidious only mentioned stopping one from dying. He never mentioned anything about resurrection. Perhaps there was a method. For the past two years, Vader toiled over these thoughts, wondering if he was simply missing out on something. Maybe there's a way to save her. He hadn't been to Naboo to visit the mausoleum that the former Queen of Naboo was buried in, but it's something he did want to do. He just didn't get much freedom with Sidious holding his chain so tight. Vader sat in the tank and opened his eyes. It was time to go. He waded through the agonizing restructuring process where his body was covered up with the suit of Darth Vader. The most painful thing was just existing in the suit. It was several inches taller than he was before he was chopped to pieces. The exercise in the suit made him all the more uncomfortable. In the time since having the suit, he had gotten used to it for the most part, but he was still unstable. He couldn't function quite like he did. Sure, he was stronger, just due to the sheer size and power that the suit could throw out, but he wasn't like Anakin Skywalker. It was something that irked him more than anything else. Though Vader had been busy, despite his time doing countless missions for the Emperor, he was constantly going out into Imperial ranks to discover secrets. The Empire was full of these secrets, and if an individual was willing to pay the right price, then these secrets would be revealed. Vader had been paying prices. He could get anyone anything they wanted. All he had to do was just take it. Most of these people wanted either power or credits. For those who wanted power, Vader could just find an excuse to kill an officer, while credits on the other hand were just as easy to come by. As it turns out, the Empire worked in tandem with several crime syndicates in the galaxy. They didn't actually do anything for them, it was just more or less the Empire turning a blind eye, taking supplies, and supplying slave labor. Of course, if any of these groups acted out of line, if there was a rebellion of sorts or whatever it was, the Empire would clean up the mess with no mercy. That's all that mattered. They maintained control over their power. Vader learned about Rampart's directive to destroy Topoka City on Kamino, and even through these secrets he learned about Mount Tantus on Wayland. This was within the first few months of the destruction of Topoka City, once Vader actually learned about the secret trade in the Empire. Despite Vader participating in the trade of secrets, he didn't go much higher than an admiral. Most people with higher clearance codes either didn't participate in the trade, or were too close with Palpatine to worry about the trade. Of course, those close enough to Palpatine could gain more, but not enough to convince them to betray the Emperor. Plus, the entire point of Vader doing this is because he figured out that Sidious wasn't telling him everything. Through this trade, he was able to get to people who worked inside of the Tantus facilities. Despite hundreds of Kaminoans being killed off, there were still a number of those who worked in the cloning operations on Tantus. Other Imperial projects were highly secure, so Vader was unable to learn about Jakku or Exegol. But Tantus was his place to start. The sources he had on Mount Tantus informed him about the cloning operations, and Vader had one very simple request. Take the plans and bring them to him. He didn't care what it was, but he wanted it. It was a very good thing that people feared Vader the way they did, because if they didn't, this would never work. Despite a genuine ability to garner something by trading secrets with Vader, there was another factor. It was Darth Vader. He was semi-merciful. If someone didn't want to trade secrets off the bat, Vader did give them a pass. He knew that some Imperial officers liked to actually grind their way to the top, and he had a degree of respect for those who had the grit to do that. Most of them didn't, because the Empire was a leech. It turned everyone who worked for the machine into a piece of the machine, aside from those few cases, obviously. Vader could just easily kill whoever didn't deliver on their secrets, or those who tried to snitch on him. Anyways, who would believe a regular officer over the Emperor's pet? <laughs> no one. Vader's secrets continued to foster inside of his head, and once the plans were given to him, he siphoned through them for days. Whether he was in a back to tank or not, he was having pieces of it digested in some way. If he was in the back to tank, he had a protocol droid explain everything to him. Really simple. 
Vader learned about everything from the facility on Mount Tantus, and so he decided that it'd be best for him to begin his own experiments. For the first time since his fall on Mustafar, there was an ounce of hope within him. An ounce that wasn't entirely reliant on the dark side or revenge or Sidious, one that came from within. He wasn't locked in on hunting Jedi. Despite having killed maybe a dozen or so since Order 66, he was on hiatus. He obviously lost count, but he was obsessed with hunting Jedi, and said he's put him in a timeout. Obviously, Vader didn't like this at all, but he used it to his advantage. Once he went through all the information, he learned that some form of cloning was being done on Tantus. He didn't realize it would pertain to a necronancer strategy that Sidious was creating. As Palpatine said about the tragedy regarding his master, it would be one he would avoid. The entire purpose of the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise was a lesson Vader would never learn, avoiding death and immortality. Vader didn't care for this because the one person he was trying to clone didn't have the ability to use the Force anyways. For weeks, information would go back and forth from Wayland the Vader's flagship. Of course, these messages were all by word, of mouth, and data chips. No one wanted to get in trouble. No one knew why Vader wasn't going through the Emperor, but no one questioned it. The fear Imperials had of Vader was enough to put them into a constant state of submission. With the knowledge he gained, Vader requested for three Keminoan scientists that weren't Nalase be brought to an old Keminoan colony on the far side of the galaxy at Oravio. Vader knew he couldn't just risk going anywhere near Sidious, and just any planet wouldn't work. He wanted to get it started immediately. Yet another fine example of Vader's incredible patience. Though it would take time, Vader knew it, but he didn't want it to take time. He wanted everything ready now, but to do it in such a fashion would only expose him to a life of torture, thanks to Sidious. He couldn't let his master become aware of this, so Vader did what he decided was best. He enlisted the help of a couple Imperial officers some of the ones he trusted the most, and ordered them to do a couple things for him. His promise to them is that they would have all their career goals accomplished and more galactic credits than they knew what to do with. The collection of officers couldn't deny these offers. They did, to an extent, realize there was a risk. While the Emperor was a threat, no one, at least within the Imperial military, was as threatening as Tarkin. He was extremely close with the Emperor, and his loyalty to the Emperor ran deep. Tarkin met Palpatine when he was just a senator from Naboo. Over the years, that dynamic continued, and since they were close to the same age, it made it easier for them to get along. Many officers feared Tarkin because he had an icy presence. One didn't need to have the force to feel it. Despite these challenges, these officers believed in Vader's vision and got to work immediately. This allowed Vader to continue being Sidious' errand boy for the following months. Vader would get continuous updates, but he wouldn't know anything until months later his ship took him to Boravio. The planet was once a colony for the Kaminoans, but it was abandoned because it couldn't be funded forever. Vader didn't know if Sidious knew about it or not, but from the looks of things, there was no reason for Sidious to know about it, due to most of all the projects being on Kamino before and through the Clone Wars. Vader's arrival was welcomed with a number of the Kaminoan scientists, the ones who could go missing from the radar at Tantus. Some of them were aides to Nalase on Kamino, but not at Tantus. They picked up a lot of her skills, and others were just individual cloners who wanted to get away from Tantus. Life on Wayland was hell, with terrible work hours and malnutrition. There was no guarantee that Vader wouldn't be the same way, but it was hope. He gave them the instructions and told them exactly what he wanted. As for the officers who were doing the dirty work, they were given their first little incentives to the work they did. The mission Vader gave to the scientists was to reanimate the late former Queen of Naboo, Padme Amidala. The scientists had to get to work fast, especially due to the chances that she had already decomposed inside of her coffin. Luckily for them, she was still mostly kept together, though the scientists had a lot of work to do. Thanks to Padme having been in the public spotlight for so long, they were able to gather an idea of what their clone should look like. Thanks to contacts inside the Empire, the Kaminoans were able to get up-to-date samples so they could broaden their chances of success. In the middle of the night, during a small raid, Padme's family had their DNA stolen. Of course, to them, they woke up thinking they got bit by massive bugs, but it didn't matter. The Kaminoans got what they wanted. Vader would be slightly impatient for the longer part of a year until they got the call to come to Boravio. When he returned, he saw a number of individuals that had no sense of familiarity. It was a bizarre look to him. The clones had the look of Padme, but not the look of Padme. It was everything looked alright, but the eyes, the mouth, and the ears looked like somebody else's, which is what they were. The Kaminoans were kind of disappointed with his reaction, but their series of trial and error got them to a point where it wouldn't take them nearly as long to come up with results. During this time, Vader was undergoing his own change. Despite continuing to run errands for Papa Palpatine, he was feeling a sense of hope grow within him. He despised the suit, and to have a chance at something fresh and new gave him a sense of newness. A reason to be giddy and excited. That's what he had. 
this continued state of excitement. Vader wanted to believe that Padme would come back to him, and if she came back, then they could be happy together. Vader could forget this entire Empire thing and become Anakin Skywalker again. The whole Vader persona was something he made up over the years to make himself feel better for what he didn't have. To call himself Anakin Skywalker to beat Anakin Skywalker felt like an insult, but the insult was all the worst parts of Anakin. If Vader could embody all the best parts about Skywalker, then perhaps he could reclaim himself and be the person he should have been. Though Vader didn't get his hopes up. Despite the giddiness and excitement, the tearing at the back of his head continued to remind him that everything he wanted would probably just be taken away from him again. His second return to Borovia would have him filled with more optimism. He found that the clones looked exactly like Padme Amidala, which only got his heart to soar with butterflies. But there was one key difference. It wasn't Padme. She looked exactly like her, but she wasn't Padme. Her soul wasn't there. The glistening smile was a shadow of the person he loved. The eyes that used to fill his heart with the starlight was nothing but a chasm of memories he couldn't let go of. To Vader or to Anakin or whoever he was now, he didn't know how to process it. The clones didn't act normal, but it was because there was no development. She was just a husk of a human being with a soul that hadn't been born yet. Vader didn't understand what was happening. He remembered the clones from the war and how they were so vibrant with their own personalities. While Vader never met Jango Fett, he was convinced that the clones were literally just adaptations of Jango. But there was one key thing Vader forgot about. These clones were just new to the world. Despite them entering the galaxy the age that Padme was when she died, which put her and Anakin at around the same age, they had no conception of anything, like an infant's mind inside of an adult body. The child soldiers of the war concept struck Vader, and he was left with confusion, sadness, and anger. What really killed him was the reaction he saw from the most perfect Padme clone, when he lost his cool. Despite the little understanding of anything, the clone had basic reactions of a human being, things that every human naturally had. The fight or flight reflexes and Vader challenged all of them by simply existing. His hulking presence, mixed with the anger he displayed in front of her, forced her to fear him more than anything that she could fear. As he tried to explain himself, the clone ran away. Vader stood there in silence. He didn't know what to do. The past couple of years taught him to use the dark side, but now he felt like to use the dark side was to lose the only person he ever needed. Vader's silence left room for awkwardness to brew between him and the Kaminoans. They kind of just offered an olive branch of sorts by suggesting that in time a personality could develop within the clone, but the clone would never be the woman he was trying to clone. Vader's silence was met with a twisting of his head and the storming forward of his boots. He towered over the Kaminoan scientists, despite their long necks, and demanded to know what they meant. They respectively took their turns speaking, but the consensus was that when they made the clones of Jango Fett, they had to develop their own personalities. Unlike Padme, the Jango clones were born as infants and raised with accelerated growth. The Kaminoans were able to take that childlike mind and foster it through an accelerated training program. The clones therefore had years to develop their own personalities. One of the scientists, who actually worked close with Alpha and Omega, concurred that exact replica clones of Jango Fett weren't exactly like him. She continued and said that he probably would recognize Alpha, who was Boba Fett, the child that Jango wanted to have for himself, which was an unaltered clone. Omega was the same thing, she was just without a Y chromosome. Vader didn't know what any of this meant, but essentially Omega was a girl, Alpha was a boy. Omega was able to become highly intelligent because she spent so much time with Nala Se as her lab rat. She was always learning and due to the Kaminoan brilliance, she continued to do that. Omega was able to become one of the most brilliant and advanced clones on Kamino. Vader wanted to know the point. What was the point they were trying to get to? The scientists told him that Padme Amidala, the former queen of the Naboo, would never come back. She would never be her again, though there was potential for this clone to become what they would call a shadow of her. One of the scientists mentioned how the ARC troopers that were bred to be ARC troopers were closely tied to Jango's genome, so they were pretty much replicas, personality-wise as well as skill-wise, but they also developed their own personalities. Vader asked them if it would be possible to get this Padme clone back, and the Kaminoans told him they didn't know, and despite their desire to not piss off Vader, they had to be honest. One of the scientists told him that losing the suit might help with her ability to reconcile with whoever Anakin Skywalker was. At least get to know him as a person, not a suit. Vader looked at the scientist and turned back. He told them to have her be turned into Padme Amidala, or he would destroy all of them himself. Vader stormed out of the room and took his shuttle back. There was now a tragic presence in his heart. There was a blissful optimism. However, what sat behind it was a downtrodden despair that ate away at him for the last couple of years. The fight between light and dark always existed within Anakin Skywalker, but for the first time in a couple years, it really existed within Darth Vader. Despite all of his attempts to destroy Anakin Skywalker, he was still holding on. 
Being that Borovia was so far outside the core and the mid rim, Vader had to make a stop at a rock in the middle of nowhere for refueling. He hated the idea of stopping somewhere, but he had to. While he was waiting for the ship to finish refueling, he was mumbling to himself. It was incredibly hard to not be audible while mumbling to himself inside the suit, but one of the passing by droids heard him say the name Padme Amidala. They stopped and turned, telling him that patient 1,390,213 had perished. Her remains could be found in the mausoleum on the planet of Naboo. Vader whipped his head back around and demanded to know what the droid meant. The droid repeated the patient number and told him that she could be found on Naboo. Vader demanded to know why Padme Amidala was out here on this rock. The droid told him the exact date that she was brought in and the fact that she had given birth. Vader popped up and asked if there were security recordings of it. The droid acknowledged that there were, but civilians weren't granted access to it. Vader made some condescending threats and was able to get around to getting the security recording. Though, maybe after having seen it, he may have wished that he hadn't. It was his visions, the ones from when he was nothing more than Anakin Skywalker, years ago. It was Obi-Wan next to Padme, telling her to not give up. Vader watched everything unfold before his very own eyes, and then it got to the end. Padme told Obi-Wan that there was still good in Anakin. This did more than shatter Vader's heart. It broke him from the inside out. Despite all of his attempts to reanimate his wife, she had died with her final thoughts being on him. Vader stood silently in his suit and closed his eyes. He was a young man again, standing inside the council chambers. He was looking out across the city and he could feel the force from Padme, as if the children were allowing her to experience what it was like to wield the force. In a moment when they were so far away, they never felt closer. And then, after that, he lost her. All of Vader's self-loathing due to his loss sat right in front of him yet again. He had one choice. He could make the right one, or he could make the wrong one again. Like the Force had presented him with the ability to not screw things up again. Vader looked at the droid and thanked him for showing him the recording. He returned to his vessel, got into it, and then prepared to depart back to the core. One thing that sat on his mind for the entire duration for his trip back to Coruscant is how he'd handle the message the Kaminoans gave him. It meshed really painfully with what Padme said in her last breaths. Between the scientists telling him to lose a suit and Padme telling Obi-Wan that there was still good in him, he didn't know where to go. One major thing that sat at the forefront of his mind was all the acts of destruction he committed in the past couple years. He couldn't escape those actions, but the sound of Padme's sweet voice telling Obi-Wan that there was still light in him convinced him that perhaps there was something he could do. Maybe he couldn't reverse his actions, but he could make up for them, right? Still unsure, his vessel dropped out of hyperspace. He looked at the city world of Coruscant and began his descent. Sidious was expecting him in the Senate building, but the Emperor was making one of his rare appearances before the Senate to talk about who knows what. Vader made his way to the Emperor's office that was situated below the Senate chambers. He walked in and saw the Royal Guard. They didn't say anything. They never did. Sidious was busy talking about whatever he was talking about, and Vader just stood in silence. The memories, the thoughts, the words, everything fluttering through his mind like a whirlwind, upping his emotions and bashing him with them. Vader looked at the structure that held Palpatine and twisted his blade around bashing the two world guards before whipping the lightsaber across the room. It slid through the device that was holding Palpatine up. Vader used the force to crush the sides of the massive tower, and then it slid down. Sidious was standing at the top of it, and when it dropped, he fell with it. Masameda, who was standing next to him, fell with it as well. They both weren't expecting it, and it happened to be so fast. Masameda landed on the entrance of the room and then fell in, dying on impact. Sidious, on the other hand, used the force to cushion his fall. But due to the sheer speed and shock of it all happening at the same time, he wasn't able to fully cushion himself as he landed on his back. A number of bones in his back were broken on impact. Sidious rolled down the side of the pod and called for his royal guard. He couldn't see the entrance of the room, so he assumed a Jedi had come for him. While there was an eerie silence in the room, the Senate chambers erupted into pandemonium. Vader walked around the corner like the Angel of Death, and Sidious called out to his student, demanding to know what was happening. Though Sidious had all of his preparations in case this happened, he left with his fingers to shoot lightning at Vader, but the Dark Lord's lightsaber hadn't returned to him yet, and it slid across the room and crushed Sidious in the back. Darth Vader looked down and didn't say anything. His flair for the dramatics didn't exist in the moment. He just left in a state of pure confusion. He could hear troops running towards him, so he extinguished his lightsaber and turned back to see them. It was a couple of stormtroopers. Vader almost wanted them to say something. The idea of gutting... No. No, that wasn't right. If he wanted to see the change, he had to embody it. If he wanted Padme back, then he had to be who she would accept him to be. This monster was not Anakin Skywalker, and he, he wasn't Anakin anymore. He had to uncover who he was years before. It would take digging within himself, but once it was completed, it would be so worth it. The troopers noticed it was Vader, and then they looked down at the dead bodies in the room. They looked back to Vader. 
They then turned around. The troopers knew his reputation. They weren't going to mess around and find out. Vader watched them leave the room and then a wave of confusion washed over him again. Was he the Emperor now? He looked at the dead bodies again and he could hear the Senate amid a tense discussion. More or less, everyone was trying to figure out what was happening in the Emperor's office. Vader decided he could fix this, potentially. He made his way up to the Senate pods and walked into an empty one. His heart fell to his stomach. The empty pod belonged to Naboo. Vader couldn't help but sense the irony in it as he stepped onto the pod and pushed out of the dock into the center of the chambers. The chattering slowly silenced as a shadowy figure of darkness staked his claim at the center of the Senate. He looked around and thought. Memories flashed back again to the words Padme said, and then their conversation on Naboo, the one where he and Padme talked about the politics of the galaxy. He channeled the inner workings of her mind and the person he knew her to be. He told the Imperial Senate that the Emperor died from a faulty control panel in his office. With the Emperor gone, the Empire would continue its strength, but it would do so without an autocrat. Vader finally looked up, finally feeling enough confidence after having spoken to the Senate for a moment. He told them that the Senate would become an Imperial Republic, one where the collection of people would make their own voices heard. He stopped and then said that the Empire would never have a singular speaker, such as a Chancellor or Emperor. The power was clearly too much for any individual, and the time had run out for an autocrat. He wasn't the best at using his words, and that was clear. Imperial Republic was simply... it was something. But the Senators, for the most part, understood what he was trying to say. The Republic was restored in its own way, but there was no one to maintain control over the power in the Senate. It would be the first time in thousands of years that the government didn't have a singular voice to lead the Senate. There had always been a Chancellor, but no more. Of course, the Senate could change, but there was this overwhelming feeling that perhaps Vader killed the Emperor. There was just no confirmation. It was just a vibe that they had from Vader when he was in the room. Despite his actions, which rid the galaxy from Sidious, there was still an issue looming for the Empire, and for Vader. Despite his desires to return to Anakin Skywalker, a war broke out. It was an Imperial Civil War, one led by Tarkin, and those close to him against the Empire or the Imperial Republic. Being that Tarkin had been so close to Palpatine for several decades, it was only natural. Tarkin was calling his regime the Iridu Alliance. Being that Tarkin was from Iridu, it made sense. Of course, it wasn't just him who rejected this new empire because countless systems joined in. And what made it even more challenging was Tarkin was entirely responsible for the little thing called the Tarkin Doctrine, which inspired most of the Imperial military to become, well, more militaristic. Vader, despite his desire to become a wielder of the light, looked back on what was the perfect reflection of his life as Anakin Skywalker, the beginning of a war following the murder of a couple individuals. Maybe Palpatine, Masa Meda, and a couple of royal guards weren't comparable to Tusken Raiders, but in Anakin's mind, it was like poetry. It rhymed. He took the forefront of the Imperial War effort, as the Civil War descended on the galaxy. His desires to upkeep what he believed Padme would fight for kept him at the front of the war effort. The irony of it being that Padme would have fought for the Empire he helped restructure. However, she wouldn't have wanted a war. She was a peacekeeper and to see the galaxy in full-out war again would have broken her heart. Anakin hadn't considered that, but he dove straight into war. As the war began, Vader was the darkest he could be, but as the war started to stretch out across three years, he became less and less dark. The Empire would thrive off of those who had their loyalty to Vader and the idea of the Empire, though those officers who helped him earlier also got their promotions as well. One name who would rise to the ranks exceptionally quick was a man who captained a small cruiser-esque vessel. He ascended the ranks and became a fleet admiral before becoming known as Grand Admiral Thrawn. His tactics and brilliance allowed the Empire to take a foothold against the Iridu Alliance early in the middle of the second year of war. When the Empire started taking its foothold, it was the beginning of the end. While Vader was actively trying to rejoin the light, active war wasn't easy for that, especially when most of the foes you cut down are sentience. Land battles during the Imperial Civil War only got worse as the war continued forward. Tarkin's alliance was inspired by guerrilla warfare techniques, and it was the only reason they stayed involved in the war for so long. But Tarkin's defeat would come at his home world, when Thrawn arrived in the Chimera and a brand new Super Star Destroyer under his control. Tarkin stood no chance, and he was killed. Months later, the Iridu Alliance would surrender to the Empire. With the Imperial Republic working as a genuine democracy, Vader disappeared. He, as Anakin Skywalker, was the closest he'd ever been to the light, and since he became Vader at least. Something remarkable started to happen as well. Despite his constant use of Bacta over the years, for the first time since his loss at Mustafar, his skin started to clear up, and his hair was starting to form on his head. It was wonderful, but he knew within himself that it was time to return to Borovio. He couldn't breathe without a respirator, but over the years during the Civil War, he was able to change the suit around. It was more agile, but actually built to fit and not hurt. He wasn't in constant agony, and he was able to enjoy himself. 
He did a lot of this work during his in-between time during the war, simply building pieces for his legs and using his skills as a mechanic to make everything fit him a little better. Though the one thing he had help with was what his medical droids were going to install into his neck. It was a potentially dangerous operation, but essentially, Anakin wouldn't have to wear a mask or a respirator anymore. He wanted his face to be open, and despite the fact that he couldn't really feel anything due to constant numbness, it was better than scaring everyone. The one day Anakin felt like he could go to Boravio is the day he looked in the mirror and saw his blue eyes looking back at him for the first time. The excitement in his heart made him desire the moment even more, to look at Padme and feel her presence. She was there, and he was waiting for that ever so perfect moment. By the time he made his way to the former colony, he was no longer wearing the mask, and his surgery went successfully. It was a little uncomfortable, but it would be for a couple of days. He landed in the hangar bay at Boravio and ran through the hallways, and as he did, he looked down the hall and saw an elegant woman looking out into the clouds. A small tablet was in her hands, and she was looking at it. And then she heard her name called. Anakin ran forward, and she looked over the voice. Anakin stopped, and he told her it was him. She asked for his name. He told her, and caught his breath with a smile across his face. She asked if he was General Anakin Skywalker from the Clone Wars, and he nodded his head. She said that she thought he died in the defense of the temple at the end of the Clone Wars. He shook his head. Despite public records, he was standing right here, right in front of her. There was a moment of awkwardness between the two of them, but it picked up moments later. Though Anakin would be left in disappointment, his time with Padme would never be rekindled. She would reject him and express her desires to be free of this prison here on Boravio. She didn't want to be trapped, and she expressed no desire to be with anyone but herself as she began her own journey across the galaxy, and even the desire to change her name. It broke Anakin's heart, but as he sat at the end of it all, he watched Padme disappear. And then he thought to himself, he realized that maybe there was a reason for it. Maybe despite everything he did, he was always meant to lose her. And while it would be easy for him to do what he did before, he understood and realized in the moment that the Padme he had would never come back. It was a sick and twisted truth, but he could not change himself. He changed himself before and lost her, and to go back down that path would only be the sickest contort of irony. To do all he did, to shed the suit, to lose the darkness, and at the end of it all, he did it for someone else. But he only ended up there for someone else. It was never what he wanted, a desire to be the Dark Lord of the Sith never crossed his mind, because at his heart, Anakin Skywalker's a good person. Maybe a little arrogant and overbearing, but he was a good man. So maybe his wife was gone, but his children weren't. Maybe the Jedi were gone, but his master wasn't. Instead of self-loathing and falling into a pit hole of despair and depression, perhaps he could reconcile with what shouldn't have ever needed to be reconciled with. Maybe he could have happiness that he desired, but without Padme. Anakin heard over it. There was no lie about that. There was pain for not having his wife back, but his children were out in the galaxy and they needed to be found. So Skywalker began his quest to find them. With the Inquisitors killed off during the Imperial Civil War, some of them switching teams, dying on Tarkin's side, there was no one to hunt down Force users anymore. Obviously there weren't a ton of them left, but because of Vader's early demise, there was probably around 40 or more Jedi left in the galaxy. There was a hope for redemption, though Anakin's focus was finding the children Padme named Luke and Leia. The names hurt because despite their superior technology, especially on Coruscant, Padme and Anakin didn't want to know what their child would be. Of course, they didn't know there was going to be two of them. Regardless, they came up with the names Luke and Leia together. They were both so similar, so they liked the names. It was a cute way to keep the letter of the name they liked and the same number of letters. Padme seemed to, and her pain and distress, use those names because she must have known her time was coming. While Anakin was out searching for his children, the officers who served him so well under Sidious' regime came to him with more secrets. Despite Vader's intent on secrecy, Grand Admiral Thrawn discovered who Vader was simply by understanding the man that he was serving with. Vader told Thrawn to keep the information quiet, but obviously he didn't. Thrawn knew that Vader was returning into Anakin Skywalker, and so he found some information about a past regime, and he requested for Skywalker to come visit him on Coruscant. Thrawn by this point was the overseer of all Imperial military operations. Because of all of his power in the galaxy, he was able to dispatch system fleets to wipe out the syndicates due to the Imperial Republic's stance against slavery and piracy. This did cost the Empire resources, but it did not matter. The Empire was a different system than it was before. Regardless, due to the access to the Jedi Temple where Sidious built his throne, Thrawn was able to find some artifacts and information he found relatively interesting, which is why he brought Anakin back. Also, while the Empire wasn't as distinguishedly abusive as it was under Sidious, it was still more militaristic than the Clone Wars era Republic was. Thrawn and Anakin walked through the halls of the temple into the archives, which were still considerably kept together. Some of the bookshelves were ripped apart, but the informational computer had a lot of information within it. 
Go figure, Thrawn found a triangular artifact and presented it to Anakin, and told him that he learned the late Emperor apparently had facilities on both Jakku and Exegol. As depicted by the Jedi of old, the triangular device was a way to find the facility on Exegol. Thrawn turned back and told Anakin that the facility on Jakku was demolished. It appeared to be another cloning facility similar to the one in Mount Tantus. Thrawn suggested that perhaps there was foul play at hand, and Anakin agreed, telling Thrawn that he would make his way to Exegol. Thrawn had his loyalties to the former Emperor, but the status quo of the current state of the Empire was one of power. He decided that Tarkin's arrogance was a key reason for the Civil War to begin with. Thrawn was alright with an Imperial Republic, and with his status, he could be an active assistance to anything he needed help with in his personal life. Skywalker took his vessel and sped away from Coruscant, using the Sith Wayfinder to traverse across space. While he never found the one that would have been his personal Wayfinder on Mustafar, he used Sidious's, which was all the more ironic for him. When he eventually did arrive, he could feel the swelling of the dark side. It called to him like the drink to a former abuser of the drink. Vader could feel it swarming him, and as he stepped out of his ship, the soft touch of a chill lying against his heart pulled him back to the person he no longer was. Just like a drunk to the drink, Anakin pulled himself away from the darkness and rejected all of his attributes. The first step of rejection was the hardest, but each step that followed was only encouragement of his resistance. He walked past Sith statues taller than anything he'd ever seen on Moraban or Kreis II. He walked down to the depths of the temple on Exegol, and he found something that made his skin crawl. It was test tubes upon test tubes, lifeless husks of flesh floating around, and so he ignited his blue lightsaber, saved from the crimson hell it used to burn in him. Anakin then saw a man who was on his knees. Anakin pointed the blade to him and demanded to know who he was. The man looked up, but he was so unfamiliar, not a feature in his face resembled someone he knew. He didn't know his name, he didn't know who he was. A wicked voice creaked out from around the corner. It was the last surviving member of the Sith Eternal. While Sidious's death wasn't the end of the Sith, Maul's destruction and the death of Darth Vader were. So when they both died, the temple on Exegol was shredded. One member survived and tried to resurrect his emperor, but the time had already come and gone. Sidious was no more. Skywalker told the man that he should go. There was no place here for him. Anakin had no clue who he was, and the man knew but he didn't know who he was, there was just a little bit of understanding. It was also convoluted to the man, but he got up and ran away. The last member of the Sith Eternal looked at Skywalker and took his last breath, as Anakin struck him down. Instead of his heart, he felt a terrible shame, but it was for the best. Killing the Sith Eternal was one more step to eradicate the lineage of the Sith. Anakin turned to the few remaining cloning pods and destroyed them, before taking his own vessel and leaving. In hyperspace, he informed Thrawn of everything that happened and what he found on Exegol, including a bunch of Imperial Star Destroyers that didn't have any active construction crews working on them, likely due to the destruction of the Sith Eternal. Thrawn was thankful for the knowledge and they ended the call. Skywalker returned to his interest in seeking out his children and decided to try and find Bail Organa. Aside from Thrawn and those couple Imperial officers, no one knew about the return of Anakin Skywalker, so for Bail, it'd be quite the shock to see someone like Skywalker walk up to him, but it's exactly what happened. Anakin painted over his suit, so it didn't have as much of a menacing look to it. When he arrived at the Senate building, he made his way for Bail Organa's office, and eventually he found it. As he entered, he could see Bail looked up ever so briefly to welcome whoever he allowed into his office. Anakin could see it. His eyes switched up, and then he squinted to see if he was seeing what he was seeing. He couldn't believe his eyes, and he jumped back. Anakin was unaware of how much Bale knew, but it clearly was a lot. Bale pulled a deactivator and shot it. Anakin used a force to catch it, and he shook his head and told Bale he wasn't here to fight. Bale was still unnerved, and Anakin asked if he could sit. Bale didn't say anything, so Anakin sat down. Bale looked on, and all Anakin said is he wanted to know if Bale knew where his children were. Skywalker was ready to be what he should have been. Bale stood back and told Anakin that his children were not meant to be seen by him. Anakin didn't react. It was a stiff burn, and it did flare up some anger within him, but he knew that Bale was right, and Yoda and Obi-Wan were not stupid, and they obviously wouldn't allow the children to be found by him. Anakin told Bale that he was a changed man, he was no longer a Sith, and he wouldn't do any more heinous acts. Despite what Bale saw in the Senate chambers, he didn't believe it, and he didn't want to. There is no good reason for him to think that Anakin would suddenly realize that he was wrong. Despite a war in Order 66 and all the atrocities he committed, there was no reason to believe Skywalker. Anakin put his hand on his blade and put it on Bale's desk and shifted it over. He told him with sincerity in his eyes that all he wanted was to see his children for the first time. They were the last of Padme Amidala. Bale sat down, and the two of them talked for hours. It was a painful talk, mostly for Anakin, but to open up to another being was somewhat relaxing for him. It was hard to open up, and he struggled with it a lot before the Order fell but now he was glad to have the ability to open up and talk with somebody. 
At the end of the talk, Bale told Anakin that he would consult some of his allies about it and then get back to him. This led to both Obi-Wan and Yoda being called from hiding. The only reason they actually came is because they believed it was a trap. Yoda felt Sidious' death through the Force and believed that the Empire was finally undoing what had been set in motion by Sidious. Kenobi was cut off from the Force, so he was unaware of basically everything. When the two of them got to Coruscant with Bail Organa, they met Anakin Skywalker, which was really a struggle, especially for the man who watched the same person standing before him burn to death on the lava banks of Mustafar. Everyone assumed Skywalker had died, but that was clearly not the case. Obi-Wan was so shaken by the sight that he didn't say anything. Yoda, on the other hand, was on edge. Obi-Wan had his lightsaber with him after digging up his and reburying Skywalker's. They stood there and looked at him, and Anakin smiled and told him that he was back. They looked at each other, and Bell reinforced what Anakin was saying, though he told them everything Anakin said to him inside the tent of four during the trip to Coruscant. It was so hard to believe, and for Obi-Wan, it was especially emotional, trying to hide his tears from breaking free. Anakin wasn't on a tangent about his new empire or trying to cut him down. He was smiling at him the same way he had before Obi-Wan went to Utapau. It was the last time he ever saw Anakin Skywalker. All the nightmares Kenobi had over the past several years left him distraught at the very idea of ever seeing Anakin again. Most of his dreams were pain, suffering, and death. Things Jedi should avoid thinking about, but he couldn't avoid it. The memories and dreams came with a vengeance every single night, and he had to suffer through it. And the only semblance of a peaceful dream stood before him. He asked Anakin if it was really him. Anakin smiled and nodded his head. Obi-Wan stepped forward, but each step was slower than the first. As if he would get too close and Skywalker would vanish like a ghost. Was he wrong for thinking that his boy would be swept away by the darkness again? Obi-Wan stopped. He was a mere few feet away from Anakin, and he told him that he was so sorry. Sorry for everything. Anakin looked at the tears bubbling in Obi-Wan's eyes as he had to live with what kind of pain he put his master through. Anakin shook his head. He told Obi-Wan that he wasn't his failure. Obi-Wan outstretched his hand and gently touched Anakin's face like a long-lost father would. Anakin looked at his master and a tear slipped into Obi-Wan's hand. Then we pulled Anakin a little closer, but didn't pull him all the way in, before they wrapped their arms around each other and embraced. The years that slid by, full of endless torture, led to a reunion that dimmed the stars. The moment passed by and it felt like an eternity, but when it came to an end, they looked at each other. Some of it was shame, some of it was joy. A lot of it was a love they had for each other. Brothers are paternal, it did not matter. They were always there for each other, and now they could be again. Hours would pass by as they all caught up and talked. Anakin expressed all he wanted to do, and the two Jedi thought that perhaps it would be okay. A lot would be okay. Anakin could perhaps connect with his children, and the Jedi could rebuild. There was a chance for a fresh start for everyone, and all they had to do was move forward. Obi-Wan and Yoda would go out together and begin rebuilding their order. With the Empire no longer interested in the Jedi, there was a chance for the Jedi to return from the desolation. While Anakin wanted to meet his children, he knew how difficult it would be for them, and he accepted it. He couldn't just throw himself into their lives. He needed to gently trod. With Leia, it was much easier because Bail in a way trusted Anakin mostly because of Obi-Wan and Padme before she died. However, Owen did not want Anakin anywhere near Luke. Owen took him in and raised him like his own son, so there was absolutely no reason for him to not be defensive over Luke. He didn't want that monster anywhere near the boy. It was hard for Anakin, but he accepted that it would take time, and he would have to earn Owen's trust before getting a chance to meet with his son. This challenged Anakin so much, because as Vader, he could just hide in the darkness. Everything was easier when you could force your will onto anyone else and make things the way you wanted them to be. But in the light, you just couldn't do that. And it was a continuous lesson for him to learn. He couldn't force the clone of Padme to love him. He couldn't force his children to have to accept him, nor Obi-Wan or the Jedi. He may have not legally done anything wrong, aside from a few war crimes as Vader, but morally, that was a much different story. He was alone. More alone than ever before, and he couldn't really help but reflect on everything. But it was his choices that let him hear. Sure, there were inconveniences, but he made the choice, and he would have to continue making the right choice if he wanted to right his past. And if he didn't learn, he'd be no better than his past self, something he would not be able to live with. As the weeks and months continued on, Anakin was able to work on building a relationship with his daughter. On Tatooine, he was starting to get someone with Owen, but it wasn't much. Nothing hurt Anakin more than hearing Leia call Bail dad and call him Mr. Skywalker or simply Anakin, as is the consequences of his own actions. This would continue for years, eventually as he built a bond with his son too, though Luke called Anakin dad a lot quicker, simply because he already referred to Owen and Brew as aunt and uncle, so there wasn't really too much of a difference for Luke as compared to Leia. 
As the children got closer to adulthood, Anakin watched them develop into incredibly talented people. While he was allowed to teach them the Force and such, he also encouraged them to be themselves. Leia's fascination with the art of politics led her to follow in her dad's footsteps, while Luke's lust for adventure allowed him to follow in his father's footsteps. As Anakin maintained these relationships, he rejoined the Jedi Order, which wasn't even a fraction of its former size. The members of the Order weren't many, but it was better than nothing. There was Nari, Cal Kestis, who was in a relationship, Seer, Kanan Jars, who was also in a relationship, Gungi, Grogu, and a number of others. It was so tiny and Anakin's presence could be hard, especially for Kenobi and Yoda. Most of the people here were not inside the temple. Most of those who were inside the temple had died. Reva had died in the Imperial Civil War alongside the Grand Inquisitor and the other former Jedi who joined the Inquisitorius. Luke became fascinated with the Jedi, and with his father, joined the ranks of the Order at 16. Owen didn't want him to, but Anakin told Owen that he would replace his son to work on the farm until he could hire help. It was a way for Anakin to give Luke what he always wanted, a chance at that adventure. While the Jedi outpost on Osis wasn't large, it was home, and it was a beacon of hope. Yoda used a seeing stone on Corvus to send out a message to the wider galaxy to bring Force users to Osis, or to Corvus and then to Osis. It worked, and then it brought several former Jedi into the Order, Ahsoka being one of them, and Ezra being another one though he was brought into the temple by Kanan and Hera, who were on Lothal for a short stint. Despite the radical change in the Empire, there were still some corrupt cells that hadn't been weeded out, which is exactly why Ezra's parents got caught up in, and which is why they died. On the 15th anniversary of the restitution of democracy inside the Imperial Republic, Anakin would accompany his daughter to the Senate building. She was now the Senator of Alderaan, replacing her dad who became the representative. Bale's belief in Leia came from his recognition of her strong character and his belief in young leaders over elder ones such as himself. While Anakin and Leia were walking through the celebration and chatting with other diplomats, she told Anakin that she would be back. When she came back, she asked to speak with him alone. As they walked out to the balcony overlooking the city, she told him that she was thankful for his efforts to replenish the chance at a democracy. He smiled at her and told her that it was all that was necessary and didn't deserve a thanks. She shook her head and told him that if it wasn't done, then she would have never had her dad. Anakin looked back and told her that that was just somewhere inside. <laughs> Leia smiled. She shook her head, revealing a small box and handing it over to Anakin. He looked at it and asked what it was. She told him to open it, and so he did. He looked at what seemed to be a small bracelet. Leia called Anakin dad for the first time, and his world froze for a moment. As he looked back at her, she said that she learned that her mother had a Japur snippet given to her by Anakin, so she made a Japur snippet for her father, something he could always carry around with him, in case he ever felt lost amongst the stars. Anakin's smile twisted and turned as he tried to escape the emotions crawling into his eyes. He told his daughter that he loved her, and all she could say is, I love you too, Dad. A decade would pass by. Leia would begin seeing a smuggler she met when she was doing work in an Outer Rim world, and eventually marry Han Solo. Anakin and Han had an interesting dynamic. Not toxic, just interesting. Luke, on the other hand, became the youngest Jedi Master of this new order, being 22 when he became a Master. Anakin would have been a Master at the same age had he stayed the path of the Jedi. How ironic. Luke continued to stay in the order and thrive as a Jedi Master over the years. Eventually, one night on Osus, a man came and was greeted by Grandmaster Kenobi. It was very common for people to bring their children and or loved ones to Osis so they could become Jedi. It was an initiative created by the Imperial Republic to rebuild what had been destroyed by Order 66. Obi-Wan placed the child with the other four. Hours later, Master Anakin Skywalker would walk in with Obi-Wan. They were talking about this and that and Skywalker stopped. He pointed over at the infant and asked if that child was new. Obi-Wan nodded his head. Anakin looked over. Kenobi told Anakin that the father was, well, he was the man he saved from Exegol. Anakin's eyes twisted back, and he told Anakin that the girl was believed to have similar powers as her grandfather. The Metachlorian counts were off the charts for this generation of children. Not Anakin off the charts, but closer to the aging Luke and Leia off the charts. Skywalker said one word and asked Obi-Wan if she was a Palpatine. Obi-Wan nodded his head. Anakin felt his hand slip down to his belt, and he unlatched his lightsaber. Obi-Wan couldn't see from his position and the way that Anakin was standing. Skywalker felt the weapon in his hand, and he was back inside the council chambers. He looked at the children calling him Master Skywalker, asking if he had come to save them. Anakin came back to the moment, and he could feel sweat dripping down his biceps and stopping at his metallic arms. He slowly put the weapon back on his belt, and turned back to Obi-Wan. The aging Jedi Master asked Anakin what he wanted to do with Rey. Anakin smiled. He told him that he would allow her to make her own choices. He would watch over her training and give her guidance. Though the choices she made would not be a reflection of the name 
a grandfather had, rather the individual she became, and she from there could choose a belonging of her own. Obi-Wan smiled at Anakin and patted him on the shoulder, telling him he was so proud of him. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Tim Teddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Weewoo670, Anakush Dank Runner, CT7565, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Jenny DeGuin, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kallik, Young Lee Slayer 66, Man Manage Studios, Anakin 003, Forda's Legacy, Star Wars, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, The Man Three First Names, Dark State 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadway for supporting the channel. There's so many names. Let's get more names on, on the thing. Do it. Do it. I want to I want to mispronounce more names because it's funny. I'm actually really embarrassed about it. Anyways, okay, so this is kind of weird. This video is kind of like a what if off the other what if, but it's also heavily ingrained with parallels, which is all intentional in a weird way. The the what if of the last what if wasn't intentional. I just happened to choose this video because it's like, oh, I can write this. But this is literally like in the last video, what if Anakin uh, didn't lose his limbs? He goes the dark path. This is him going the light path. Obviously, there's something else. Uh, encouraging that difference so it's not exactly what if of a what if but it's kind of like a weird parallel there but the the parallels that are within the story the mirroring techniques are something that you see throughout star wars whether it be george lucas star wars or disney star wars it's something that's consistent it's the mirroring techniques that george used in the prequel trilogy from the original trilogy that continued into the sequels and so i just did that here i just flipped things with anakin and it's a lot of mirroring techniques that went into anakin's story that the entire imperial civil war and all that stuff and so i really like the intricacies of that uh, this video was really fun. I'm not going to lie, while I was recording, I will be 100% honest, I almost started crying at the Leia part with Anakin. That was probably the most emo emotional piece I've written in a story, so I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.